Thanks, Sadie. Welcome, everyone. Um, today's speaker is Barbara Rose Johnson, who's an environmental anthropologist at the Center for Political Ecology in Santa Cruz. Her work explores the linkages between culture, power, environmental crisis, and human rights abuse. Dr. Johnson's work examines the driving forces and controlling processes generating crisis and inhibiting meaningful remedy. Her research is action-oriented and chronicled in some 16 books, among them Water Culture Power in 1997, a very seminal work, Half Lies, Half Truths, subtitled Confronting the Radioactive Legacies of the Cold War in 2007, The Consequential Damages of Nuclear War in 2008, which won a major prize, in addition to more than 125 articles. <coughs> Uh, she's led an interdisciplinary effort to assert alternative perspectives in the UN Special Rapporteur Investigation on Human Rights and the Environment. She's developed a key briefing for the World Commission on Dams. She served as an expert witness and researcher for the Marshall Islands Nuclear Claims Tribunal. Served as U.S. Representative to UNESCO IHP Water and Cultural Diversity Advisory Committee served as an expert advisor to the UN Special Rapporteur for Human Contamination and Toxic Waste, investigation into continuing human rights abuse associated with nuclear weapons testing by the United States and the Marshall Islands, among a number of other appointments, including um, on hydro development and human rights abuse in Guatemala. Her work has been acknowledged by the American Anthropological Association with the 2002 Kimball Award for Public and Applied Anthropology, among many, many others. Her, uh, she has a bachelor's degree from the University of California, Berkeley, and a PhD from the University of Massachusetts. Uh, to, after this talk, there will be an open discussion with students, uh, which you're all invited to. Tomorrow, there is a presentation, an open discussion, uh, titled The Precarious Hydrosphere, the big picture on why biocultural health matters from noon to 1.30 in Croon, G19. So everybody, please join me in welcoming Barbara Rose Johnson. Thank you. Thank you, Chris. Thank you, Sadie. Sadie has a sheet at her desk that has a place where you can put your name and your email, because today's remarks, I have a, um, a summation of the major points plus all of these resource links. And uh, rather than cut down more trees, I think it makes sense to email you all a, a document. So sign up on that if you'd like it. And I just want to do, as by way of point of entry, a few, little bit more on, on who I am. Um, like many of you, I'm an interdisciplinarian. I have a master's degree in environmental science before I went off to get the, the doctorate in anthropology. And um, when I got to, to the University of Massachusetts, back when dinosaurs still roam, um, <laughs> They said, what do you want to study? And I said, well, I'm here because you have a Caribbean program. Oh, yeah, well, one of our professors is actually in, in the loony bin right now, and the other's just been bumped up to Provo. So I had no one who was my advisor, which for me was awesome. I was an independent studies person. Um, I was interested in that intersect between environment and what was going on, in part because I started out after my Berkeley degree working as a planner, doing environmental impact analysis and long-range planning. Uh, at the county of Santa Clara in California. And that meant at the time that Silicon Valley was just starting, we didn't have that name then, and it was just starting to boom. So as a 21-year-old, I was the kid who could go up and say, I'm sorry, there are archaeological resources here, to a mafia <laughs> representative who was turning all of their orchards into track homes. Um, I learned a lot about power as, at a young age and decided uh, that this wasn't necessarily a world for me and went back to grad school. I got the environmental studies degree because I wanted to know what was going on and why and how did things change, but especially the biophysical long-term perspective. So I was interested in paleoecology and cultural ecology, and the, the, the cultural creation of drought in, in Caribbean islands where I was living at the time. Um, I did it for fun. I knew I would never apply that master's degree. I was going to go on and get a doctorate in anthropology anyhow, and they probably wouldn't count it. The interesting thing is that those science courses that I took all of those years ago in, in, in ecology everything, paleo, you know, tropical ecology, human ecology, cultural ecology, biological ecology, et cetera, ended up being one of the most important facets of my career because I have one foot in the sciences and one foot in the social sciences, and I straddle that divide. 
So my first job, I was hired out of, uh, with my PhD teaching environmental studies at mm -hmm. Sac State. And this was in the late 1980s. Walls were falling, right, literally. Uh, and we had the, this, this new documentary phenomenon on, on, on uh, public television. We just had the idea that you had CNN had just come out, that you had satellite TV just came out. So the world started getting connected to what was happening locally in a very different way. Um, especially the rainforests are burning, satellite imagery showing for the first time ever all of the burning rainforests in Brazil. And, uh, and so the late 80s was a very heady time for environmental activism. The, the 1990 Earth Day, first one that were, was the largest protests around the world to date, um, and it was a global protest over environmental uh, degradation around the world. The 1992 Earth Summit um, was the culmination of a lot of this. So this is when I was teaching and teaching environmental studies and very frustrated that environmental studies at that time dealt with human problems as population and the problem, but no depth no understanding of what human conditions are, of the, of the, of, you know, the varied experiences and, and most importantly why there's so many inequities in the world. This activism around um, Rio, uh, Sierra Club Legal Defense Fund, now known as Earth Justice, uh, brought a petition to the Human Rights Council and said environment, the right to a healthy environment should be a fundamental human right. And they did this just a couple months before Rio and it captured the world's attention because Chico Mendes, who was a, an activist in Brazil and had been featured in a, TV, in, a, in a documentary that went around the world on satellite TV, had recently been murdered. And the world's attention was focused on not only rainforest burning, but the people and the plight of the people that lived in these contexts and their struggles. So the right of a healthy environment, the way that they responded at this um, uh, convention was to appoint a special rapporteur, the first special rapporteur, the Human Rights, then it was Human Rights Commission, to explore what is the right to a healthy environment. And they put out an, a, a call, global call for contributions. I saw that call and, and at that point was interested in writing my own textbook. So I contacted the main organizers, Sierra Club Legal Defense Fund, and I said, I'll trade you. I sit in anthropology and interdisciplinary professional organizations I have, I'm connected to these global networks of people who are on the ground documenting the experience from a, from a community perspective or an indigenous group perspective. Um, I'll give you the, I'll, I'll help you get access to that information. You can share what you've got. So we agreed to collaborate. It was shocking at the time for this UN sponsored study. The notion of, of the right to a healthy environment was focused just on individuals and individual rights. The notion that only individuals have rights and they are being violated. So that meant journalists who are thrown in jail because they um, reported on where nuclear waste dumps were in, in the Soviet Union, for example, um, was the attention uh, and, and the focus of it. When the anthrop anthrop environmental social sciences came in, it was anthropologists and geographers and some um, ecologists and so forth, um, ethnolinguists and indigenous rights organizations. When we came into the story and started pulling together the study that I chaired and coordinated, um, it was the first time that, that the Special Rapporteur and the Human Rights Commission had considered that groups have rights. And that rights are being um, abused, not just by individuals. We had a, a, a complaint mechanisms in the international human rights laws was evolving, but that complaint mechanism was only focused on prosecuting individuals. Even today, you can prosecute an individual for crimes against humanity, but you can't prosecute those who profited for those crimes, or the banks that, you know, especially the World Bank, for example, that might have funded a project and, and, and created interest and profited from that. Um, so the idea that processes lead to human rights abuse, created by governments or international governmental entities, and that groups have rights are being violated was new. And that was something that we were putting forth. We put out a, um, a study called Who Pays the Price? The Social Cultural Context of Environmental Crisis. And this tells you how long ago it was because the imagery is so blurred and our photos were really poor back then. Island Press uh, eventually published this in 1994 and it was the first environmental social science text that nonprofit um, science-oriented uh, publishing house in, uh, ever put out. Um, more importantly though, we put out reports in 1991 through 93, annual reports that went to um, the UN, and that helped inform and support the positions the rapporteur was taking. 
Um, but we also, I got a grant from the Nathan Cummings Foundation to produce, we took five of the most egregious, nasty, disgusting cases, so obvious, demonstrating these points, that groups have rights, that processes like militarism uh, and development were, were, were responsible and, 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 and that there was this culpability gap, a huge culpability gap. Um, so this booklet was funded and we, and we sent out 450 copies by mail to all of the top human rights organizations in the world all of the top environmental organizations in the world, and then to all of the foundations. And at, that pushed and created a sea change in the notion that human rights and environment actually were connected. After that, foundations started funding these issues, and these organizations started morphing and evolving and changing to look at those intersects. So it was really interesting. We, we also had, thanks to um, American Anthropological Association, then had a congressional fellowship uh, program, and, and our uh, member in 1992, Greg Button, was a uh, staffer to Senator Wellstone. He died, uh, sadly, uh, about two years after this, but he was pushing through Congress this new bill on the right to a healthy environment, and he died in the process of forming this bill. It sort of languished. When Clinton came in, he signed it in as an executive order. Um, that's why we have environmental justice on the map in the United States and, and so forth. At any rate, Greg Button managed to get into the, every member of the incoming Congress in 1992 got our booklet on who pays the price, the social cultural context of environmental crisis. And that was in their welcome to Congress, here are the issues packet, which shows you the power of having a well-placed individual at a, at a given time. Um, I also um, published the, the whole report, dis, distilled down into this book, and sent it to um, the White House, to Al Gore, to Kathleen McGinty, who was head of the Environmental Quality, uh, White House Council on Environmental Quality. Al Gore read it, and he used it in his reorganizing government and sent it to EPA and said, we need to make this approach as a centerpiece, community, community approach. Government's role should be to help communities, empower communities to identify, define, and address their problems. This is where I learned some of the, the differences between what I'm pushing for and how it might be received in the sense of beware what you ask. Um, because the way it gets interpreted, at least in the Clinton administration, the way it was interpreted, this approach is, it's actually in, in the federal government's interests for communities to take ownership of their problems because before then the federal government was responsible for paying and providing the technical expertise and so forth, in, in, especially in the context of EPA, Superfund site cleanup and so forth. So it was a way of reducing the federal obligation and increasing uh, state and local obligation, um, mind you, with good intentions, but, but some of the outcomes, uh, again, are beware what you ask for. So that was sort of my point. In, in pulling this together, we wanted to come up with the most egregious cases to make the, hello, this is out there, the poster child cases, if you will. One of the most egregious cases was the lingering consequences of nuclear weapons testing um, and the whole nuclear, nuclear fuel cycle change, be that a uranium mining, processing, milling, production and manufacturing of weapons, but also all of the energy infrastructure needed to do that, um, use, and then, of course, the, the, the consequences. Um, so I'm going to switch more, more intensely on my talk now to just talk about this one of many cases that, that we pulled together and, 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 um, and pushed in, these, in this initiative. Um, after dropping of the bomb, of course, the world did not see these photos but, but the, uh, for, for many years, but the U.S. came in shortly after. They, they seized journalists' photos and files uh, who were on the ground, especially in Nagasaki, and, and that became long buried in, in the classified bowels of government. But they contacted the Manhattan scientists that they could, and as soon as they could, they got them to Japan to walk around and help document. So one of the key Manhattan scientists that had been working um, uh, in Rochester at the time, James Neal, was brought out as part of this team, but also with a couple of the, of the, the head um, bio the biologists and doctors that were looking at human effects of radiation during World War II. And they went out and took pictures and they interviewed folks and then they, they said, gee whiz, there's a whole lot more to this atomic uh, uh, field than just a blast and just radiation, which is what they had predicted. Radiation causes would blast, sun, you know, burn your skin, 
initially incinerate you. And, and that's what this d documents is radiation burns. But also, and not just the devastation from the force, they started recognizing, especially after talking to the Japanese doctors, of, these ra of the radiation diseases and sickness that was already immediately apparent. So they came up with an approach to fund through the National Research Council, the Department of what was the equivalent of the Department of Defense back then, the US government, funded through the National Research Council an Atomic Bomb Casualty Commission. And the purpose of the Atomic Bomb Casualty Commission in the explicit classified version was to document, to study and document the human effects of radiation, um, not to treat. The way it was presented to the world was that the U.S. was going to facilitate and assist in, in Japan. And what the Japanese living in, in Hiroshima and Nagasaki and, and more broadly expected was that with all of these doctors coming in, setting up hospitals and labs, that people would be treated. Um, they, just a, a little word of context, well, maybe I'll get to it later. At the same time they were studying the human health effects in Japan, they needed to understand clearly not only the power of this, but demonstrate it to the world. So they set up in 1946 tests in the Marshall Islands, which was at the, uh, a protectorate. It was uh, um, islands that Japan had been occupying. During World War II, the U.S. came through. It was an occupied territory by the U.S. military um, at the time. A year later, after these tests, the United Nations gave them trust territory status to the United States. So at the time, they were just an occupied nation. Um, and they, they took all the remnants of the World War II fleet from the Pacific region. They also brought some ships in from the Atlantic German boats. And they put them in the Bikini Lagoon, and they did two, two they also brought in representatives of the United Nations and from 27 different countries, including the Soviet Union, on these boats. I think it was something like over 27,000 people on boats to observe. And so the world could see the power of this weapon for themselves. And um, so that was in part the early Cold War, you know, this is what we got, you know, back off. But also, what they didn't expect, they did an above atmosphere shot and then they did a subsurface shot. This is the subsurface shot. And this, you can see one of the ships going up into it. What it did was it atomized the whole coral lagoon, right? And that went up and it also transformed as it atomized into this massive dense wet cloud that then dropped all of this heavy, very radioactive debris over all of the remaining ships that weren't destroyed in the detonation. They, overnight <laughs> or immediately um, managed to decimate the entire Pacific fleet. Um, and then they had all of these folks who were watching, observing, and, and the poor soldiers who were, or, or military personnel, who were supposed to go out and clean up and make these boats useful again. Months and months and months, years actually, trying to decontaminate. This is where they learned that radiation and the properties of radiation were so much more profound than understood. Anything with a carbon-based structure, it adheres to and transforms. So if you have metal on your boat, iron, for example, uh, that you're walking on, afterwards you have radio iron. It's no longer just iron, FE. It is a radioactive isotope of iron. So if you're walking on that boat, they found that they, that, you know, the idea, these, they're in the Pacific six degrees above the equator. People want to wear shorts, go barefoot, etc. So all kinds, it was not uncommon that people were getting see through the, you know, their, their skin burns, but also at night people were glowing in some cases, some documented cases, just by walking on these decks. So they learned that, that atomic warfare is a real messy enterprise and we need to do a whole lot more science. Um, they, the Atomic Bomb Casualty Commission started structuring the human health effects component of it. The Marshall Islands was designated as the Pacific Proving Ground, and that's where they studied the ecological effects as well as the human effects. Um, this is James Neal right here, who set up a, um, a pregnancy outcome study. Five years, they, if you wanted to get food rations in this part of Japan, you had to sign up for and be part of these studies if you're a woman, if you're pregnant or just had a baby. Um, you couldn't get food unless you signed up for the study. And that meant that you went in and you got documented and they took samples and they took, did ethnographic interviews as well because James Neal believed that, um, that radiation and, and, and it, uh, had no problem in terms of genetic effects. He had a, 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 a natural history degree studying fruit flies. Everyone was concerned that radiation would have uh, this massive genetic effect. But his premise was that, that other factors are greater 
in potentially delivering the effect. And those other factors include cultural factors such as marrying your cousin. He was a eugenics um, uh, scientist and he believed that, uh, and afterwards, after World War II, they called it genetics, this early field of genetics, that if you married your first, second, or third cousin, and this was one of the questions in the, in the Japanese pregnancy study, then any offspring has a higher potential to have congenital defect because of that relationship at a genetic level than because of the radiation exposure. So they pulled together the study. Every single person, as you can see, the mass data collections um, was, was counted in it. Kids and, and families and so forth were documented and assessed. They also studied things like what was happening with babies and children as they grew. And they took x-rays of their long bones. Physical anthropologists helped come to interpret that. Some of the things they documented was that um, radiation and atmospheric radiation from these tests creates a lot of strontium and that strontium actually adheres to the bone and it was causing major stunting in Japan, meaning children that were exposed at high levels were not growing to the potential height that their siblings or family is, but also mental stunting as well as physical stunting. The scientist that, that documented that um, submitted his report and it was classified and censored and, it, and he believed it would stop any future uh, nuclear weapons testing and, and in fact because of censorship it did not. So you can see some of the um, tests that they were doing and as I said they went to the Marshall Islands at the same time to establish the Pacific Proving Grounds. 46 was the demonstration test. By 48 they had their first rounds of, of next generation weapons. In 48 in, in 51 and 52, any time they did nuclear weapons tests in the northern atolls, they evacuated people. Um, I just wanted to give you a sense of Marshallese map. Marshall Islands, anyone been there? Well, it was off the map, actually, from, from 1946, well, and, and in a big way from 1958 all the way until 1973 when EPA was created and they first got access to the islands. Marshallese were not allowed to leave without approval of the United States government and no one was allowed to go in. Um, and it was one of those, it's like a secret city uh, and you had secret cities in Chernobyl, you know, in, in the Soviet Union, you also had secret territories in the Pacific. So you, when I was brought out, and this is an aside, in, in 1999 contacted to facilitate an investigation with the Nuclear Claims Tribunal in the Marshall Islands, I went to USGS to try and get maps for the nation. And I was told they're still classified. I couldn't get access to maps that USGS had, had created. So it was really interesting. However, the, what is the place? 1,200 or so islands, 22 atolls, an atoll is a coral reef with a little sand spit on top, highest elevation in the nation's eight feet, um, except for the, the two-story buildings on, on the Capitol Island. Um, yet these are the master navigators of the world. You have people living there for 10,000 years with this, in an area the size of Mexico with tiny dots of sand and palm trees, right? And mostly it's, it's a water world. And people from the northern chain all the way down to the southern chain, think again of the stretch of Mexico, speak the same language. 10,000 years of being there. It's because they are the, the uh, navigators. Uh, they, they use outriggers. They're the ones who are now causing a reinvigoration of that um, ancient art of navigating by the stars and the winds and the currents and using an outrigger to get around in the Pacific. So that is a map that they make to show you where, where, where are you in the Marshall Islands. Of course, when you're living in those places, you're living in water-stressed areas. No rivers, lakes, streams, none in all of the Marshall Islands. You have little uh, brackish ponds from rainwater and, and sometimes you'll have a, a well that you can tap into with brackish water atop the saltwater lens underneath these coral islands. Most of the water comes from coconut or fish from what you eat. Um, so that's an important dimension as it turns out. Everything you make is from, well, of course, what you have around you, which means your mats, your clothing in traditional times, meaning uh, up until World War II, really, your clothing was made from um, fibers from the plants that grew around you. Um, you're cooking with the coconut holes. So, nuclear weapons tests, the first hydrogen bomb in 52 was tested there. The U.S. assured with each of these tests, if it came out, um, the 52 tests were illustrated in Life magazine, not until 1954. Um, but they assured the world whenever any outcry came up in the United Nations that the people in the Marshall Islands are fine, they're safe, there is no fallout, there are no injuries, that this is a, a controlled process, that you can do a bomb up into the air or drop a bomb and the, and the release goes up 
And they thought of the atmosphere as like the ocean. The solution to pollution is dilution. If you put it up in the atmosphere, it will be diluted around in the world, and you won't have to worry. Bravo test changed their thinking. Bravo test was March 1st, 1954, and it was the dirtiest detonation the U.S. has ever done, and by far the dirtiest nuclear disaster to date, including Fukushima. Um, and it was a, uh, a subsurface blast. It was purposefully designed as a, as a thermonuclear weapon to be as dirty as possible because one of the scientific questions they were asking in this lab of theirs, how big of a city can we wipe out? How big of an area can we wipe out? And they had monitors throughout the nation documenting where did fallout go. And fallout went uh, to, radi to populated tolls. It turns out in 1999, and they finally acknowledged that the whole nation was carpeted with, with um, lethal levels of, or near lethal levels of, of, of uh, fallout. So this is a, a boy who was exposed because he was outside running across the reef when fallout cloud came over, and he's from Rongelap. Um, once they realized whole populations had been dangerously exposed, the, the first recognition being weathermen posted in the area. They evacuated the weathermen, and then a day and a half later came and evacuated the people of Rangelap. They also evacuated nearby atoll Utrecht. They decided that the people of Likiep, in another atoll, also horribly exposed. There, there was too many to fit on a boat, so they left them there and they left them in the contaminated environment. So the people in Utrecht and the, and the people in Rangelap were taken to um, Kwajalein, and, and a top secret study was initiated, Project 4.1, which looked at the human effects over time, meaning 30 days, 60 days, 90 days, three month period, and then they decided to keep Rangelap there and study them for three more years. Utrecht was returned to their atoll. Meanwhile, at the same time, the 1954 study, the pregnancy study in, in Japan, they were pulling together their data, and they came out with massive evidence of de congenital defects, of, of early termination, and so forth. But they were able to say, it when all was said and done, no statistical relevance, because any, any evidence from someone who has had a first, a second, or third degree, it was a product of a first, second, or third degree marriage, um, was tossed out. The other reason they were able to throw it out was because the, the or dis, discount, was because the, um, there was these artificial notions to their study. They said, here's the blast zone. They drew a little map. And, and if you were outside of the blast zone, they, we don't have to worry because they didn't understand or recognize fallout. Right? It was just in the blast zone. And they compared, as a con good control study should, they used as a, a, a comparative um, population from the town of Kure. Now, I went to Hiroshima a couple years ago, and I went on top of the hotel with my husband to have a martini and look out the window and say, oh my God, I can't believe we were doing this, and see there's the bay, and I can see Kure, this control city, from where I'm sitting. And I went back to the fallout maps, and you can see you know, <laughs> that this is whew, right there, right there. So they had flawed fl samplings in their controls. So the study came up with a whole host of issues that were identified, which they said was not necessarily statistically re relevant. They did notice at a statistical level changes in the male-female ratio, um, meaning that um, reproductive effects were documented, even at that level. Um, but they decided, we're not going to look at this in the Marshall Islands. So they set up this study in the Marshall Islands, and the initial study that then was discussed in 1958 in this high-level classified conference, beta burns, loss of hair, depressed red cell and leukocyte counts, um, flu-like symptoms, nausea, fingernail discoloration, radioactivity in the urine, changes at the cellular level in blown, blood and bone marrow. All of that which we understand to be precursors in things like leukemias and a whole host of other cancers. Now we understand this in hindsight. Um, they also decided we need to do more study, <laughs> and we have this great, wonderful, um, controlled population living on an island. It's the perfect laboratory. Um, they, while the, the people of Rangelap were being studied between 1954 and, and 1958, they did more nuclear weapons tests. The, the atmospheric ban passed it finally in 1958, and they did literally almost one or two tests a day during 58 to try and get as much information and data as they could before that atmospheric ban would go into effect. 
So you had massive amounts, as if you had one Hiroshima bomb every day for the whole from 1946 to 1958. I mean, massive amounts of radiation coming up into the atmosphere and into the local level fallouts. They documented not in the radiation ecology studies, not only fallout and its movement through the, through the soil and through plants, the bioaccumulation in certain kinds of plants, but also through the, not only terrestrial creatures, but the, the, the marine, so fish, clams, crabs, the marine food chain. So despite a recommendation from the, from the medical doctors who were studying the health effects to not let the people of Rangelap get any more exposure to radiation, they'd already been more exposed than any other living population on the planet. Um, they returned them to their heavily irradiated environment in, in, in late 1957, and they were there while they did another round of tests through 58. Um, of course, the people of Marshall Islands were not informed about any of this. About, they didn't even understand nuclear or the term radiation, what that meant until 1973 when EPA came and educated them. In the long-term study, they set up, they had doctors come to the Marshall Islands uh, initially once a year and then once every, twice a year, and they came out with, with ships and, and they've had um, um, uh, cement lined, lead lined uh, caverns so that they could assess your radiation. They monitored blood, they took blood samples and bone marrow samples of children. If you were in the Rongelap population, they also identified control subjects that were matched at the same age. People who were forced from Majuro, for example, the capital island, to participate in these studies um, as little kids because they matched the age. They, they initially were looking for things like, um, they were wondering about diabetes because of those red blood cell changes that I mentioned early, earlier with Project 4.1, they were recognizing that diabetes and, and metabolic disorders and heart uh, problems were all related and perhaps that was what was happening, would happen here. And while they documented that, what surprised them was that they found by 1973 population-wide uh, nodules and thyroid cancers. So the first identification relationship between radioiodine and its effects on the thyroid and cancer came because of their experience. This is Dr. Kennard, who was the head of the study. He had a, a friends in Michigan where his home base was, who, excuse me, his home base was in, in Brookhaven. But he had friends in Michigan who were um, a pharmaceutical company coming up with how do we develop a, 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 a hormone substitute for, for thyroid so that we can help treat this in the event of nuclear problems or radiation um, accidents in the United States. So they tested it on the Marshallese, one of many t opportunistic tests that occurred over the years um, for just, here's our population, let's figure it out. And again, without, without any informed consent, without any consent, um, without any knowledge what was happening. People thought they were being treated by doctors and that was for their health. Um, they, it, it was not at all clear, and they would come into to clinic. And, and when I went through all of the, the I got, went through all of the declassified documents and all of the letters and complaints from the scientists, were often that they come up with all of their runny noses and they expect us to treat, you know, medical conditions. I, you know, so how are we going to handle this? How are we going to keep them happy? Um, the long-term study. Look at this list of what the long-term study documented because it is immense. Basically, the major conditions that are facing humanity today, immune deficient diseases, metabolic disorders like diabetes. In fact, you have the highest rates in the Pacific and one of the highest rates in the world of diabetes in the Marshall Islands now. Growth impairment in children, that stunting I was talking about. Cancers, especially thyroid and leukemia were identified in the first several decades. Now it's, it's uh, a whole host. <laughs> Hypertension, heart disease, premature aging. They had a whole study focused on premature aging. And that includes things like crumbling bones at an early age, um, uh, you know, changes in your connective tissues so you have, it hurts to walk around and so forth, um, as well as cataracts and, and, and uh, degenerative osteoarthritis. Miscarriages, congenital birth defects. Anytime any woman gave birth to a monster baby, they called them. The, the scientists would fly in or they would require local um, practitioners to, to um, collect the child out outer island, which meant a boat several days go out, dig it up if it's not, um, if it's not um, alive, and take it back as lab samples. Um, horrific, horrific history, all classified. What does that mean in terms of science? It means our understanding of radiation health effects for, for, was stunted. 
if you will, by this immense amount of research that was done, yet it was not used to inform or shape uh, uh, public health policy, let alone uh, medical science. Censorship in the Marshall Islands so, uh, allowed the suffering to, you know, you know, their suffering allowed an expansion of the militarism uh, around the world. And this map shows you, um, it does not show you the North Korea tests. So it's up to date, up to the North Korea tests. But it shows you this was a global expansion of where people tested. And, and, and as it turns out, the experiences in the Marshall Islands were also being reproduced um, in Kazakhstan, where the Soviet Union had similar human subject populations. And we've just found out, because France just declassified um, comparable databases um, uh, in December, uh, in, in Polynesia and in Algeria. Um, so with, with censorship, you all had the means for a whole well-organized and orchestrated campaign to pacify the public in the United States. And through the United States control of the International Atomic Age, Inter Energy Agency, they were able to pass this along to the world. The notions that we can understand and control the health effects. If you have the knowledge, you can build your own fallout shelter. You can protect yourself. That, there are, that a concrete wall is sufficient to protect yourself. The lived experience in the Marshall Islands demonstrated otherwise and continues to demonstrate. Um, EPA came in, as I said, a couple times in 73. They came in later uh, uh, the, the, to, to help and educate as Peace Corps workers, um, teaching them, uh, for example, some Marshallese English and how to read and write uh, and decipher for themselves. So by the late 70s, they were asking the Department of Energy uh, representatives, then it, oh, it was the, um, it, first it was Atomic Energy Commission, then it was Department of Energy, to evacuate them again. Our, they understood their atoll was con contaminated and that they, everyone was getting sick and some people were dying and that these things were related to their exposures. The government refused because they thought it sent a wrong message to the world that was just starting to grow nuclear energy. So they refused to evacuate them. Greenpeace came through in 1985 and um, spent some time on the island and then helped them on the Greenpeace Rainbow Warrior Ship evacuate to the southern part of the nation. The next stop on their chain was New Zealand where that ship was blown up. Um, again, this is 80s and, and protests over nuclear militarism but also protests over uh, expansion of nuclear energy. This is um, from data declassified in 1999, just looking at radio iodine, so iodine-131. So your big, big, huge block, that's Marshall Islands. Here's all the iodine-131 released in, at the Nevada test site. Uh, here's Chernobyl. Here's Hanford operations. So it gives you uh, just a little sense. I was looking for data to update this graph for, for Fukushima, but it's still ongoing, and so it's very difficult. It's also been... Uh, at a concerted level at, within the United States and thus the IAEA, we're not going there. We're not going to collect and amass the global data the way we did during the Cold War that allowed with, with, with global mon air, air quality monitors and so forth, uh, that kind of data collection. Um, because of that first study that I did way back when, we looked at this Rongelap case and we included it in. When we sent the booklet out in, in, to Congress in 1993, um, shortly after that, a uh, journalist uh, came out with a sensational story about human subjects experimentation in the United States during the Cold War. And it was the first time we had heard. And it caused this huge outcry that humans were injected plutonium and other sorts of radioisotopes. For, in part for gee whiz science to figure out what's going on um, with no informed consent, with no consent, knowledge of what was going on. And many of them died. So that sensational story prompted that when Clinton came in, a, um, uh, excuse me, he was in office, uh, the creation of an advisory commission on human radiation experimentation, of which one of your um, former professors, now deceased, uh, Katz, K-A-T-Z, was a key actor in. He's a bioethicist and a medical doctor here at Yale, and he was also a member of the Tuskegee in, uh, Experiment Commission. His papers here are in your Yale archive, and in those papers are many of these declassified documents that demonstrate sort of this history. So, that, so the, the advisory commission went through all of this stuff, initially on a, t on a mandate that said, let's just look at the United States and its behavior during World War II. And let's just look at that meant the, the continental 1948 states. Because of outcry from other places like the territory of Alaska, right, because it wasn't a state then, and, and all of the um, World War II human experimentation and nuclear testing there, but also the, the later Cold War era nuclear testing there, 
Um, it was expanded to include Alaska and Puerto Rico, where it turns out we did a massive array of, of uh, human subject experimentation on biological chemical warfare as well as radiation. Um, and because of my story, which I sent to Barbara Boxer, she sent to that to the head of the, uh, to Hazel O'Leary, who was head of the Energy Commission, they got the Marshall Islands included in it. So it was one of those unintended ramifications of a study, right, done way back when. Then I was contacted after this commission comes out and nothing happens in the Marshall Islands except for more declassified documents and a very limited, you know, what do we do with this knowledge? They had a tribunal set up because that when they were given independence under Ronald Reagan, he said, hey, I'll, I'll trade you. You can be independent and we wash our hands of any obligation from the damages from nuclear weapons testing. In exchange, we'll give you $150 million and help you set up an administrative court to administer that for damages. If conditions change or new information comes to light, you have the power to go back to Congress. So after Reagan signed that agreement, they set up this tribunal. They contacted me to do the, the Ron Galap story, to document the consequential damages. I did, as an anthropologist, I, I got ethnographers and, and a whole host of, ever, of other folks to go out and do island by island questionnaires on what was your traditional way of life? What was life like before this occurred? What kinds of changes did you observe? What is your way of life like now? So that we could get at more deeper questions than just radiation health effects, but damages that included loss of a way of life, loss of a healthy way of life, loss of life. Um, thanks to the declassified documents, which by that point were word searchable on, on the computer, I was able to go back and pull every single document that had natives, for example, as a key term or, or a term embedded anywhere in the text. We demonstrated, we did this massive report and we did a three-day hearing in the, in the Nuclear Claims Tribunal in 2001. Um, where for the first time, the, the tribunal of three judges, two of which were American, could hear the whole, their whole experience of a case or a claim or an injury in historical context. It's also the first time the whole um, nation and got to listen because it was broadcast by radio, the story of what happened in Rongelab. At that time, 19, in 2001, you did not have in the curriculum many of those nuclear weapons tests. So many kids had grown up, gone through schools, never had any sense of this nuclear history. And at that time, the U.S. still controlled the uh, curriculum for the school system. So again, very um, recent stuff. So some of the things that we documented are well known and common now, but it was the first time it was heard in the Marshall Islands in terms of how fallout acts in the food chain, how it moves through the food chain in the human body, but the fact that the Marshallese were the reasons we understand that and that they were used purposefully in exposed settings to document. The fact that chronic exposure to low-level radiation does more to increase the risk of developing cancers was one of the major outcomes and reasons why the U.S. does not want to acknowledge the validity of the study or address it. Um, at least different administrations have different positions. Um, I have my, my, as an aside, my notes from this talk in addition to the resources link so you can get a lot of this data in detail. Um, the, the tribunal hearing prompted protests in the Marshall Islands. Um, it also prompted broader concern it was, as it was evidence that, that it wasn't just you exposed because you received fallout from a blast or from a nuclear power plant fallout, for example, but that two or three generations later you're still seeing the kinds of, of adverse health outcomes that result, that, that demonstrate genetic effects result from living in a, in a contaminated environment but also demonstrate genetic effects because two or three generations later the really hot isotopes have degraded. Um, so hearings periodically have been held in Congress as conditions have changed and new information has come to light and they have the right to go back to Congress to request more um, resources. This is Marshallese in 2005 and that picture was part of the congressional record. Um, but Nothing, no action has taken place. This was during the Bush administration and their, their response to the Marshallese is 50 years is enough. There is no, um, the only evidence that is valid on radiation health effects is a health physics approach that says external exposures are our main concern and the primary isotopes that cause high exposure have been um, degraded by this time in terms of their half-lives. And, um, uh, and as an aside, Climate change is happening, the sea levels are rising, the solution to pollution is dilution, you will all be underwater soon, what's the point? So that was the Bush administration's you know, cavalier under, under the table aside. That position has been embraced by the Obama administration as well. 
Meanwhile, through this history, as I said, the nuclear weapons testing and the censorship allowed the growth in a, a largely uncritically questioned in terms of the science, the real power and means to question it, uh, because of the classification that occurred here and in the Soviet Union and so forth, and the lack of access to this information. So it wasn't until we got you know, global telecommunications, and especially computer and internet, that we were able to move to a whole other level of understanding this step. Protests, this is a protest in Japan, which unfortunately my original slide was um, backwards, um, but it says no nukes. <laughs> um, and this was on TV, that it went around the world sort of thing. Um, I love that one. So protests over, over the, the periodic and regular releases of tritium, for example, um, are easily countered when the bulk of information on the long-term effects of a low-level radiation has been kept out of the limelight for decades and decades. And the, and the authoritative voice in terms of Atomic Energy Commission, both in the nations around the world and IAEA, is, is, is controlled. Fukushima changed things, obviously, and it continues to change things. This map was created by the Nuclear Regulatory Commission about a week after Fukushima. Um, so this, there I am on the West Coast, you know, 48 hours. I know what's coming my way just because of my knowledge. I call up uh, right after Fukushima happens the California Department of Energy and say, are you monitoring? No, we don't need to. Call up EPA, federal, are you monitoring? No, we don't need to. It's not a problem. It's no, 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 no. So this was known coming, but it turns out, and I went to the National Archives to confirm this, that the National Disaster, radiological disaster plan, the first disaster plan the U.S. ever created was for radiological disaster. The first number one thing, control information, pacify the public. Because the primary threat from a radiological accident is public response, fear, social unrest, economic um, meltdown. So the number one thing, control and pacify. And that, to this day, is still the primary um, response. The, the aside to that is the notion that most of the injuries associated from a radiological incident um, can be attributed to psychosocial processes and behavior. Um, your fear is what creates your disease, um, being the after fact. Citizen science has, has been, again, because of telecommunications and access to things like iPhone apps turning a, with a little plug-in device, your iPhone into a radiation uh, Geiger counter. Um, so citizen science and, and access to information has been the, the counter narrative and the really exciting dimension post Fukushima. They took down a government by going out and mapping, uh-uh, look at this hot spot, look at this hot spot. <laughs> no, Fukushima, Fukushima's there and Tokyo is exposed. Um, they, their citizen science uh, was huge in, in political transformation. It was also a big lesson to the United States. And, um, in terms of, of, again, the control and the message and, and make sure that you don't get to that point. Um, this is a 2012 update map. I have yet to see one for 2013 showing you the, the releases in the ocean. One of the reasons why I do this is because the Marshallese studies, what was so important, were not only the radiation ecology of how it moves through the environment and food chain and human body, but also through the marine chain. And so some of the studies we did was map that radiation persists quite a long time, not only because of the way you can bioaccumulate or, or heavy deposits would, would uh, adhere to coral in the reefs and things like that, um, but also because they recognize there are these micro streams in, in, in currents in, in, in the ocean. So you can have a very contained, intense stream as it moves across the, the Pacific. Um, and we're seeing evidence of that uh, in terms of now and in the future of fish, of, especially of kelp and seafood products. Um, but basically, I think that the political um, response has been, well, it's the, the genie's out of the bottle. There's nothing we can do to control it. Let's just adjust and adapt and move on. Um, so all of this history prompted um, the United Nations uh, from various forces and, and it escalated because of Fukushima to appoint a special rapporteur. This category of uh, special rapporteur Georgesco that, that he, he explores, there's a number of them, is environmental contamination and toxic waste. Came out of the initial Rio conference, that, that concern. But it's the first time the United Nations Human Rights Council ever investigated nuclear weapons or nuclear disaster, ever. And it was the first time the United States in that context also, of course, was, was examined. So his, his investigation, not well publicized in the United States, I'll bet you didn't hear about it. Um, he went to the Marshall Islands and he went to the United States and he took my book and all of our documents 
and came up with a report that was presented last September to the United Nations Human Rights Council, who heard and, in, and by consensus adopted his report. It was the first time that the Marshallese were ever, to go, ever able to go to the United Nations Human Rights Council and say, here's our problems. Again, because they were a secret off the map, and because the US controlled all their movements during the time of testing, they wrote letters, but they were not allowed to leave and go testify. Um, I got them there. I went and applied to a number of the foundations that had funded my work over the years documenting the history uh, and the consequential damages of that history. And they said, I'm sorry, but, um, but this information threatens, I got approved all the way past the uh, project director level, and it was the advisory board of the foundations that nixed it, and then these are a couple of very well-known, very publicized uh, nuclear foundations, foundations that publish, um, support nuclear work, that, that my work and bringing the Marshallese story to the UN uh, at this point is too damaging to the vested interests of their board members who have in, um, invested in nuclear energy. And the, and the sense that nuclear energy is the, the solution for climate change, and especially the Obama administration and its various politics on this issue. So I didn't get any funding. Um, I went around and, and requested a few emergency grants from foundations that bring United Nations, you know, people of the United Nations, indigenous peoples. Um, Women's Fund for Global Human Rights was very helpful there. Um, but mostly I crowdsourced. I did a, a, an online, you know, Kickstarter, Indiegogo kind of equivalent and sent it all to my no friends and family. I have a big family, so that was like one third of the donations. And then my colleagues, and they sent it to their friends, anyone who'd used our books over the years, that sort of thing. So we got enough money to cover travel, to go to Geneva for a week, uh, $15,000 for five people, just for the travel and a place to stay and a bite to eat, begging for cheap or free you know, places to stay. It was pretty amazing. And they, and they were able to, to present their issues in a, in a two minute statement, the Human Rights Council, but then also we did these side events. So this is side events on the human right, rights impact of, the nu of nuclear weapons. And what was really cool about this was that um, it was not just the Marshallese story, it was the first time the Marshallese got to meet in this kind of venue with other nuclear nations, such as Kazakhstan. So this was a, a session on the, on the, the test sites and their, and their effects in um, in Kazakhstan, the Soviet Union era. And we also had people there from Australia. We had, you know, from a number of different parts of the world. Um, what was interesting in the discussion as to who made comments and who accepted the rapporteur's report and recommendation that said that the U.S. still has a remaining obligation and liability and that there are fundamental protracted intergenerational human rights consequences of living in a nuclear disaster zone. What was interesting was that um, of 160 nations have no nuclear weapons and no nuclear power in that group. That's where all of the comments came. Uh, Algeria, because they just learned that they had hosted it. Uh, Cuba, no surprise, you know, but also Australia, because they wanted to be elected to the Security Council and they were being pushed and prodded by the other Pacific nations to support it. So, you know, so behind the scenes politics. Um, none of the nuclear weapons states, none of the nuclear weapon states made any positive statement on it. The only negative was the United States, because, and they had to respond because they were being investigated. Um, and none of the um, nuclear power states, not a single one, came out on the record on this history. Now mind you, the Rongelap story is what prompted the initial test ban treaties. So historically, the reason we have a peace sign comes from the nuclear protests in, initially in London uh, against nuclear, nuclear weapons. So this historically plays a big role in, in, in nuclear militarism and advocacy, but also environmental action. And yet it was all silent. It was very amazing. All of this to say, on that unintended consequences beware what you ask for, while the Special Rapporteur's report is amazing, powerful, and a lot of it coming out of my work, which was gratifying, um, it hasn't been implemented. And instead, it, what happened, one of the reasons why all silent on the US front and especially on the media front was that the timing of this was the Bush versus, what was his name? Who was he running against in 2012? You know? And um, they didn't want to have uh, a discussion in the presidential campaign. But also, it turns out, that was the week Obama was scheduled to announce to the world or to the United States that he was approving changes in the EPA over permissibility levels. 
for radiation in the event of a radiation disaster. And um, so they suppress that. They realize this is bad timing. There might be outcry over the, the Marshall Islands and their experience with radiation. Hello. Um, so they suppressed it. It came out quietly in April 2013. I don't know if any of you heard or noticed or took notice. But what has been proposed, and because of an executive order, is now in effect. So they still have a public comment period, actually, just finished a couple weeks ago. Um, and it hasn't been officially approved. But it's already been in effect since 2013, April. Is changes in EPA's permissibility level that say we do, that what is the science and what are the standards? And it raises it further, even greater than what uh, Japan post Fukushima has, in terms of here's the critical um, level for, rate, for iodine 131, for example, in, in drinking water um, prior to April 2013. And then these are the proposed levels, depending on which one they go for, which shows you. And what it means is, is we're redefining. This is strontium. We're redefining our notions on the order of not only 100 times or 1,000 times, in some cases 100,000 times more radiation is permissible. And we're redefining also the, notice, the definition of radiation disaster. So it's not just a nuclear weapons dirty bomb by a terrorist or a group of terrorists. And it's not just a Fukushima plant equivalent of a, of a meltdown. Nor is it a San Onofre release of tritium. It can be a dump truck spill on the side of the road. It can be um, a recognition that Manhattan Project or Cold War era, era work had produced a profound amount of contamination of soil. It could be fracking and the release of radioisotopes into groundwater systems. It could be a whole host of things. And so as a result, um, we have failed to learn these lessons so far, uh, that we're all downwind that we need transparency, accountability, and real efforts that report, repair, restore, and, and, and ensure never again. And we need to keep asking these questions of who's doing the science, addressing what questions, according to what notions of, of significance and what data sets, who's ser who is served by science. Now, I gave you a whole lot of information on a whole lot of different topics. And so these are some of the, the ways that you can go get more info. On my, on my methods and praxis, especially on methodologies, this, the, the, the top article there, the, these couple of books here are, are very deep in, in not only the Marshall Islands uh, case, but, but globally the Cold War experience. Weak in, in terms of China and weak in terms of France, but strong on everybody else. Um, this document just came out at the Humanitarian Impacts of Nuclear Weapons um, uh, UN conference in Oslo last March. Did you hear about it? First one ever? No, wasn't reported really in the US press. Um, but this is accessible online. Similarly, um, I give you a couple of commentaries in part because these, these are very influential. I think of my publications, and when you think of your strategies as a scholar, advocate, citizen, of my publications which have had the most impact in terms of readership, it's doing op-eds for Counterpunch with embedded links. And they get reprinted. I did one op-ed where I you know, Google searched before I posted it, and then the next day Google searched to see just how many times had my title been reproduced and thus was on other people's blogs or reprinted in newspapers around the world. And it was 12,000 times overnight. Now, when you publish a book as an academic, scholarly Yale graduate, what are you going to get? Well, if you're lucky, you'll get 2,000 copies sold, maybe. That's generally the print run in, in a hard copy press. Um, so you know, it's, it's a very different notion of, of getting your information out there and having an influence on voice. But also these, um, these two links here for the United Nations give you how do you, if you want to see the Special Rapporteur's report, this is where you would go. If you want to see what is going on right now in the world on the EPA permissibility levels and the critical comments of it, uh, that's where you go. And as I said, if you want a copy of this stuff, please, um, Sadie will help you with that. So thank you very much. That's my overview. <laughs>